Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to um, go through, uh, we're going to uh, touch on several, um, uh, several topics which I view as kind of essential. Um, and uh, the first of them uh, concerns, concerns best practices, okay? Um, uh, and uh, these are a, a subset of, of all um, the best practices which I have uh, characterized um, uh, in other contexts. Um, uh, I, I have uh, put together um, a set of slides, uh, which I will share for you, which is much broader than what I'll touch on. I'll touch on what I view as the most essential ones likely to be most actionable for those in the room. Um, recognizing that if you look at the broader set of slides that I will be posting, um, they include a variety of technical best practices as well as some more detailed ones um, on the process side. Um, some of these I've touched on, therefore I won't go into more detail. But uh, develop incrementally and compare frequently with previous versions. Have these successive versions of the model that you look at, you inspect, often you share them to stakeholders, you learn from them, and then make your decision about what to do next based on that. You may have an idea about where you're going at a high level with your model, where it will ultimately end up, but you'll learn a lot in the process. This developing community you compare frequently. Here you're running it. You're running it for successive versions and learning something from that. And often that will take you in different directions because you see some unexpected behavior and you say, oh, you know, that's really interesting. That has a lot to do with what I'm, I'm most interested in this project. Let's pursue that a little bit. And it adds a different prioritization. So now you, you pursue a bigger model in a more savvy way. Basically. Um, show frequently the stakeholders um, for knowledge elicitation and feedback. Remember, much of the goal of, it's not so much that models are useful. So much, it, I mean, models are super useful, but modeling is at least as useful as that. It's, it's the modeling process of discovery, of reflection on what's known and what's not known. It's, it's about um, getting people to reflect on where they sit in the system. It's, it's standardizing terminology and standardizing our thinking about it. It's refreshing people's, sharpening people's thinking. And modeling is, is arguably the most important part of that. Even if the model were to disappear, you gain something great in terms of modeling often. Um, but showing a model to stakeholders, often I argued before will elicit tacit knowledge. Because they see it run and that reminds them of something they wouldn't have thought to mention otherwise, for example. Um, and you get feedback from them. You get feedback from them um, on the model that, that critiques it. Remember, models are tools for inviting critique, more quickly knowing when our thinking's off base. As such, getting critique from stakeholders about the model that really you need to change this or that just doesn't, that doesn't make sense for how you're representing this in the model, even just looking at model structure, that's a step forward. It's the success of modeling and it should be welcomed as such. But also you get feedback from the patterns when you show them um, outcomes from the model. And they better understand how models will be operating with them, you know, what they offer. Um, okay, this is a more sort of modeler-centric um, issue. Um, it has to do with this issue of traceability. Maintain a record of experiments um, when you conduct them. So when you conduct an experiment, you should try to record a set of things, okay? The intention behind it, like what are you trying to do? Sometimes, often this is neglected. But often you ran, you ran the model that time for a reason. Maybe you want to send sensitivity to a certain thing. Maybe you wanted to, to, to be able to um, uh, test the model with this extreme value. Maybe you wanted to uh, assess how, how, it, how it performed in the long term, longer than you had traditionally done it. Often there's an intention behind it. And sometimes when you look back, you want to find a model you ran for a certain reason, like that you remember the intention. And, um, and some, sometimes recording is good. The model version, like I always number my model versions, version one, version two, version three. And when I modify it in any way that will change the results, 
I will, I will go and increment the version or change the results as they were seen in previous versions. So I'll change the results. So once created, a version is kind of, for the most part, it's not modified. It's immutable. It's not changed after that. Um, uh, now, there's an asterisk next to that. I actually, like, if I have a bug fix, um, and I have an earlier version saved away uh, for some reason, I might fix this not only the latest version, but the most early, that earlier version I saved away so that I can run that earlier version and get meaningful results out. So, but if so, I have to recreate the experiment results because I don't want to be looking at experiment results that are tainted by that bug, right? That are, that are affected by that bug, that are going to be thrown off by that bug. Um, so if I go back and modify an earlier version, it'll be with that. But generally, I, once you save a version away, that's it. Um, once you're done with that version, you go into a new one. The previous one doesn't change. Same way parameter values. What were your assumptions that gave rise to this experiment? Um, potentially the random number seed you ran, so you can easily recreate it. And the results, the outcomes, or some sort of measure of outcomes. So we've had two tools that automate this. One of them is still extant. Winchell can show it to you. Um, it came out of the master's degree thesis in our department. It used aspect-oriented programming to automatically record these things. So all you had to do was add sort of one line to a certain box in any logic. And every time you ran the model, it would automatically record these things. Um, except intention it didn't record because it didn't but it would, record, it would record the other ones. Um, and it recorded, actually this is probably, I don't know, Wade would have an opinion on this, but you also want to record the AnyLogic version sometimes. Like, is this run with AnyLogic 8.3 or 8.3.2 or whatever? Uh, if you want reproducibility, that's a good thing to do. And that tool automatically does that. So if you're interested in that tool, Winchell could set you up with it and you could run it and it would be, it will automatically document things. Okay. Um, we have an, an earlier tool called Silver, which you can find papers about online. Um, there's two papers about it. Silver basically ran around any logic and around Vensim, uh, both of them, and it um, it basically kept track of all these things, including intentions, allowed you to see my results and me to see your results, and and to easily rerun the whole set of earlier results from an earlier version, run it on the latest version automatically, and all sorts of good things like that. Um, save all versions of the model, um, uh, and use tools for version control if you can. So there are these tools uh, that students in the room could introduce you to, a tool called Git, another tool called Subversion, Git is G-I-T, another tool called Subversion, Basically, they can be used to save away versions of the model. And you can save away documentation, for example. Um, and this allows you to avoid actually cluttering your file system with different versions. Like, you can just go and you, can, you only have one version at a time, but you can go back and get early ones if you want to. You can see the difference between them in an easy way. You can, you can go and um, uh, roll back to an earlier version if you want to. The latest version is not, it's not going in the direction you wanted. You can roll back. It lets you save away. Um, one of the worst things that situations you can be in here, ladies and gentlemen, is when you, you need an earlier version, but you're not sure which one it was. It's like you have a revise, revise and resubmit on a paper, and you, want, and you don't know how to get back to that version that you that used for that paper. That's one of the worst feelings that I've experienced in this year. And, um, and this, uh, you know, at least saving away successive versions for each version and having a way of getting back to it, either by having it right there in front of you or by having a version control system is good. Good version control systems like Subversion and Git, which someone like Chen Yang or someone like Narges or someone like Paul or someone like Jason could show you how to use. They're set up for teams. And so they let me be working with the model and you get my latest version and you submit some changes for me to see them, et cetera. It's very, it's, it's very productive. 
Um, and this is what's used by software developers worldwide, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a good practice. Um, okay, this is an important one. Um, ladies and gentlemen, when you discover a problem with your model, particularly a, when I say bug, I mean a case where you wanted to do a certain thing. The way you do it did not implement the thing you wanted to do. There was a mistake in the, as we say, the implementation. We often make a distinction between the design of a model the design of a model probably does anyone need this green cucumber toast okay um, you should see some of the other ones is it okay if I get rid of RCTs being at the pinnacle of the hierarchy of evidence the all-seeing eye that wakes up slumbering um, when you criticize them. Um, uh, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, by the way, Duke, uh, Luke and Stemakakis have a great paper on that if you haven't seen it. Um, um, but uh, here, um, we often make a distinction between the design of a model um, and model implementation, okay? Um, so the design is sort of what a model is supposed to do. Um, uh, and, and then model implementation is how it actually accomplishes that. So in principle, you could have a design that's implemented in any logic, implemented in repass, implemented in NetLogo, implemented in OpenM or ModGen. You could have several implementations of the same model design. Okay, um, and, and design is arrived at through model formulation, okay? It's kind of what, what I call the stage of formulation gives rise to a design. You're, 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 you're specifying the model. Implementing it is actually realizing that design. And something where design doesn't match implementation, where implementation is off from design. Um, so a uh, case where implementation doesn't implement the design is called a bug, okay? It's often a logical mistake in the implementation. There's also cases where design is off, okay? Um, and often in modeling, we distinguish, we, we distinguish between validation and verification of a model, okay? So, so if we have some real world out here, you know, we have the external world, right? Um, um, wait, external uh, world. Um, we want our model to, to mimic certain aspects, to abstract and kind of um, characterize in a purpose-specific way, certain aspects of this world. And this relationship between the, the model design, so this is kind of the model uh, design of the model, the degree to which it's the right model for our goals, the degree to which we uh, built the right model, um, that, that much is often, uh, we, we term it through validation. Okay, it's a validation step. We're trying to see if the, the model um, is, is sort of suitable for characterizing the situation in the world from the perspective of the model purposes. The step that further goes to the implementation of the model, um, this can be a little bit confusing, that's, that's verified, okay? So people talk about validation and verification of models. They're often referring to these different processes. Of course, we never have a design that's complete that we can run directly. We always run an implementation. But when we spot problems, some of the problems are because the design, like our plan for building the model was misguided. We, we characterize something in the world in a way that just doesn't jive with empirical evidence or just doesn't, it's not consistent with what we know about the world. So this, 
That's the province of validation. We've made a mistake that gets corrected through validation. We've made a design error. We've built, we haven't built the right model. By contrast, the mistakes at this stage, design to mutation, are issues we haven't built the model right. We had a model in mind, but we didn't implement it correctly. We, we did something silly. We should have written plus when we wrote minus, or we, 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 we divided by a coefficient instead of multiplying by it, or we, you know, we added the wrong variable to something, or, or whatever. Um, we, forgot to, we forgot to sell the sheep under certain conditions, or something like that. That's an implementation error. It's not that we didn't have the right idea in mind, it's just that we, we screwed up in specifying it and implementing it. So that's implementation error. And that's often caught through a, a testing phase called or, or through call verification or it's validated by, or it's tested by that. Okay. Now, bugs. Bugs are often of the sort that we, we have a we have a mistake in implementation. Sometimes we use the term to refer to things like our thinking just didn't add up in a way that's consistent with the world. We also use it, but whatever your, your way of referring to bugs, ladies and gentlemen, use the discovery of those bugs in thinking. Either think about the world, or here it's more particularly think about implementation bugs, to find other opportunities. Like, what could have allowed you to spot this mistake faster? If this is a mistake in your understanding of the world, or if this is a mistake in how you built the model, the bug, how could you have found that faster? I mean, you, you evidently did find it, and you should pat yourself on the back for, for having found it. That's great. This is a success of model. You, you found it. But is there anything that could have allowed you to find it faster, to locate that faster? Um, and um, uh, secondly, um, is there anything that could have headed off from being a, a problem in the first place, that you could have avoided this? Is there any principle by which you could have applied that would have prevented that from ever becoming an issue? It wouldn't have led it to, to become an issue. So when you discover problems, use them to learn from them. And, and that way problems become, encountering problems can be turned into an asset for improving your skills in modeling, et cetera. So, whether it's a design problem or an implementation problem, but particularly for implementation problems, you know, try to try to learn how could I have found it faster? How could I how could I have prevented it from happening in the first place? Okay, and a good principle for life, right? When you make a mistake, um, we all get embarrassed by it, but if we could turn it around and say, now I've learned something about how to avoid that in the future, we've actually taken two steps forward and just one step back. We're actually ahead of the game because we've learned how to improve our ability to, to uh, navigate in the world more effectively by virtue of this mistake. And it's a good principle to apply. Okay, one of the tools that I like to suggest, and each time we conduct it, I've, I've found we've derived great value from it is what are called model peer reviews, okay? And here, basically you ask fellow modelers, and some other people might be on the modeling team or might not be modelers, but they know enough to, they're not building the model, but they know enough to, to look at it and critique it. You basically ask them to, to review the model, to sort of look through it and, and reflect on it. And, and are there any things that that they see as problematic. Um, Jan went through this with one of her models, um, the DIP model. She went through a model peer review. We've had a number of others do peer reviews, and almost invariably we find ways to improve that model. It's not necessarily we find a mistake with it, like it's, oh, it's very really flawed, and you know, there's a black spot which is cancerously growing in it that's gonna consume it and you know, we'll all be sucked into a black hole. Uh, uh, you wouldn't be doing modeling. 
<laughs> that doesn't write find it very well. No, it's more that um, the peer reviews find ways to improve them all, like improve its, uh, communica its ability to communicate, improve its transparency, lower the risk that someone will make a mistake in interpreting it. These are all really good things. And sometimes we find oversights. Um, uh, for example, I remember one model where we found some of the relationships seem to assume the cutover from one age group to another was, um, it went up to age 54 and then it was 55 and older, but others of the relationships assumed 55 year olds and those in their 55th year were, were, were treated as the, um, as the younger category. And, and this was a little silly little thing, but it was unlikely to really hugely affect model results, but it was a mistake and, and we went and improved it. And so you have a bunch of modelers going over this model and you find just gems of ways to improve it, um, make it less confusing, make it faster, or you know, more performant, um, uh, better ways to document things, um, cleaner ways to implement things, um, et cetera. Um, so very, very valuable, these, these model peer reviews. Um, I will further just note that Using the technique that comes out of um, software engineering, we engage in a lot of model pair, pro, pair modeling. So what this is, is basically like you see going on, even as we speak probably, right through that wall. I think there's a team working right over there. Um, uh, that involves, basically you have two people working on the same model at the same time. Not in the sense that they're both with hands on the keyboard. Often one is hands on the keyboard and mouse, and one is looking at it. And what you find in software development as well as here is that even a very junior person from modeling, working with a more senior, you get a lot of value in improving the model, actually. Like, like the more junior person will have useful things to say. But needless to say, there's another huge benefit for the junior person, which is they learn about the model. They learn about modeling. And it's very useful to them to kind of understand what's going on, the thinking of the more senior model. So it's a great way to, to kind of transfer understanding and, and spread knowledge, et cetera. So pair modeling is really, really fun, interesting, great learning experience, and it prevents problems. We do a lot of this in software development. Pair, pair programming, it's called. And there's whole books written on pair programming. The basic deal, though, is that um, uh, you know, from many facets, it's shown to improve quality, and it's also something that often builds morale. Needless to say, spreads knowledge. So, so please be encouraged to use this, um, and I think you'll find it really refreshing. It's not to say you never do it without pair models. No, I'm sure you can, but but when you can do it together with someone, it's especially it's especially good. Um, and this goes along with strive for process improvement. Try to figure out ways that you can prevent problems from coming about. Or you can better um, and better um, improve how you do the modeling or the ways you conduct sessions with stakeholders, etc. This is something that's not obvious, but in software development, we talk about spike prototypes. The idea here is, is actually something that I expressed earlier with respect to Kurt Kruger's work with the Ministry of Health project. Kurt said he was thinking about switching to an agent-based formulation, individual level formulation, for, for his Ministry of Health model that he had started up. This was kind of the progenitor to, to um, UN's modeling, um, some of UN's early modeling. And, and I told Kurt, look, take a week and just try it. Just don't, don't get obsessed about this is gonna be the final model, just try it on for size. Try something out quickly. In the course of a few days, just try throwing something down and, and, and working with it. And you often learn, you learn just a tremendous amount by getting it in front of you and working with it. 
And often within the course of a few days, you get a lot more insights from a focused prototype than you would by just sitting back and musing, should I do this or should I not? You, you try it out. And the, you may wonder, what's a prototype? The defining feature of a prototype from a software development standpoint and from a modeling standpoint, I'm using this term in this decided fashion, is that a prototype is, is designed to be thrown away. Don't get caught up that this is, has to be the model and you've got to do everything in the right way and, you know, um, someone's always going to be looking at this and, and so on. No, 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 just, just take it and, and try it out and know that, okay, this is a throwaway thing. And that liberates you to try different things in a, in a very nimble way. And so you, you try something on for size. You, you sketch out the state charts for this, or you, you try doing this a causal loop diagram and, you know, within an agent. And you say, does that look at all plausible? Get it out of your head and get it in front of your eyes. Maybe you want to do this with another person if you want to. I mean, that's awesome if you, if you have someone. But otherwise, just do it in front of yourself and, you know, let your two eyes see it. And, and often you find that sharpens your thinking a lot. So, you know, you take a day, you take a week, you try this out, and you're a lot further along in terms of where that would go. Sometimes they do this a couple different ways. I sketch it out. And um, what would it look like this way, that, that way? And that clarifies, I think, a lot about which way to go. Okay? So, prototype, throw away. You're not, you're not going to use it on an ongoing basis. This is purely to try it out, and it has a, a very specific focus. Don't get caught up in, oh, I should create the main agent. And, no, just go with any logic and you know, put it in main. And it, it's a state chart that will live in agents, but you just put it in there and you think it through. And, and you, um, that's the goal of it, and you know you're going to throw it away. So it's very, very, very useful. Um, Next one I alluded to yesterday. Perform simple tests to verify the functionality of the model. Simple tests. Simple tests. Um, try running it with certain transitions turned off, like like zero rate hazards, like we saw yesterday, or ignored. Try try turning it with extreme values for rates, like like contact person from A to B, person B automatically starts repeating the rumor given to person A, or they start, they're affected in terms of their behavior by the health behaviors of person A, instead of being a 1% probability or something like that. You take values and you caricature the situation, make it in its most extreme, and you try it with these, these tests. Maybe you try your model with just two people in it. You should see the number of times students come to me and they say, well, oh, it's not working. And, and you know, they're running this model with a thousand people in it, and there's all these things going on, and they say, oh, it's not working. And then, I, almost invariably, I ask about the model, and I look at it, and, and I almost invariably say, simplify the situation. Either you like reduce the number of people to two people, or you take, you, you turn off certain phenomena and you focus only on the phenomena causing the problem, or you make the the probability sure to happen instead of probabilistically happen, so the problem happens sooner. Um, uh, you know these are these are things that you um, um, can zero in on. I will tell you another thing. Oh man, I gotta show you this. Oh, I should show you this. Oh man, yeah. Um, we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, um, if you have a model and you have parts of it that are written in code, like NetLogo code or Java code or whatever, depending on the framework, try to have some sort of specification of it, like some sort of high level description of what that is. Because time will pass and your memory will fade. Worse yet, I could tell you horror stories. Okay. 
I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one whole story, okay? Um, this, this is about five years ago, and I will not use names. But some of the most prominent figures in system science, two of them, came to me. And they said, Nate, we need your help. And I said, okay, um, tell me more. And they said, we have a model in a certain health area that we've been working on for a number of years. I think it was worked on by four years. And it had been worked on by, by two or three different people as sort of the core modeler for it. And it was a very big empirical model. Okay. A very large empirical model with tons of data related to it. And these two leading system scientists were experts on data sources that were used. So they had, they were experts on what it was characterizing and so on. So they, they had recommended all sorts of, uh, of, of, of data, you know, relevant. And the model was just, from from standpoint of design, it was gorgeous. Like it, it had a very clear, it it had a a very nice view of how to characterize things in terms of its design, characterize things in the world. Very rich, very powerful for the type of health issues it was addressing. And I was very impressed with that from a design perspective. The implementation was shocking. Neither of the system scientists understood what the model was doing. The modelers who were working on it didn't really always understand what the model was doing. There were, there were tens of thousands of lines of Java code. This was not in any line of model, I should say because any logic would have reduced probably by a factor of 10 the amount of code they would have had to write. Um, but it was, a, it was code that was written out by several different people, and it was extraordinarily complex code. It was gnarly, confusing implementation. So people who created it were not software engineers. They were, there were people with very different background, and they hacked together a bunch of code, and, and it was, I mean, it almost made me sick to my stomach to see it because it was so, it was so croftily written. Um, it was just, this is going to be much to you. But, you know, it was, it was not at all modular. There was huge lines of code with very deeply nested reasoning and so on. And you, by glancing at it, you couldn't really see what was going on. It was not commented. It, it, made, it violated all sorts of sort of rules about how you write code properly, to be transparent, to be testable, to be understandable in order to cross check its assumptions and so on. And the different modelers had worked on it and put their mark on different things of code. And, and it came down to the fact that the two key people in charge of the project, these two eminent epidemiologists, social epidemiologists, they didn't know what its assumptions were anymore because the code the code was different from the design in some ways. They, they had understood a certain design, but the what was actually implemented in the code was was completely obscure compared to the design. So they didn't know when they were running models. Is this the case? Is that the case? Now when we dealt into the code, we found all sorts of bugs. All sorts of bugs. It was running with all sorts of bizarre assumptions bizarre things going on that were absolutely not part of the design, but were just accidents, bugs in the code that like, you know, be like someone was, someone was an adult and they were being governing, governed by the rules that govern childhood or something like that. Or, you know, in the oldest age in life, they would be governed as if they were, um, as if they were in the youngest years of life or, or you know, you would have um, people, um, people come into to contact with each other, and uh, you would have, you know, uh, a sureness that one would affect the other in a big way, or, or what have you. So there's a big difference in design and implementation, but these, these people in charge of the project didn't know about these things, and they didn't know how they were affecting the results and which results historically were effective and so on. So 
the, the long and short of it is, it should have been one of the very best models ever created. It should have been a, a, a landmark in the modeling front. It should have been a, a foremost case of how modeling could be used. And it ended up grievously shortcoming, you know, shortchanging its potential and, um, and not really shedding, shedding much value because of the implementation problems. They had different people working to implement it as programmers, and the people who, who were designing the model, who were giving the guidance, couldn't understand this. They couldn't understand the implementation, and so they were blind to what it included, and their worst fears were realized when we reviewed it. And it was, it was a sad day. It was a sad day. Um, it would have taken a lot of work to fix it. Um, and, uh, and it was grossly short -changed. So just be aware that when it comes to what's implemented, if you have code here, if you have, if you have software code, you should have a high level description of what that does. So you're not stuck in this situation where you think you know what the design is, but it's at variance with the implementation or you know you had a programmer who did the implementation and you don't know what they put into place and you end up um, you end up uh, you know wondering what is the real design as it's captured here okay the design should match the implementation but sometimes uh, you're not sure because the people who go modify the implementation may have done so without making it clear and there may be bugs so, so this is a big issue with modeling. And I wanna, I wanna give a point of advice here. When you're looking to build these models, it's a common mistake to say, for example, with any logic, we need, okay, I wanna build an any logic model, I need a programmer, that's what I need. And you hire a programmer to build you the model. And that's often a big mistake, because you want someone who has the training to understand both of these stages. You want someone who will be able to understand what's a appropriate design, which designs are, are suitable and give you feedback and have dialogue with you about design. If you're dealing with a programmer, they're gonna just say, you know, what should I implement? And they're not gonna know about modeling. And so they may do all sorts of bizarre things. Ladies and gentlemen, the, student, the things that distinguish every student of mine in this room is an appreciation for how to go about both of these, implementation and design. But too many modelers end up hiring people thinking it's an implementation task alone that they need. You hire a programmer who knows nothing about modeling, and you get a disaster like we saw with that model. You get a disaster. They basically say, Okay, tell me what you want, and they have no understanding of what its references to the world, and often and only a crude idea. So you want someone who is yes understands the implementation, but understands the design enough to have a dialogue with you, and so you want someone who has you know model model uh, design and implementation skills um, if you're going to be working with a, a technical person, and that's a much smaller group by about a factor of 100,000 than the number of people who know Java. There's tons of people out there who know Java, but if you go and say, I've got this package any logic, or, I, or could you learn this net logo so you could, you, could, you could do net logo coding in the model, it's gonna be a disaster if they don't understand model anyway. You need people who understand this idea. The model has gotta be some sort of simplified representation of the world, and it has this structured relationship to the world and, and you know, how to characterize high level uh, constructs in the world using modeling and, and et cetera. This is a big, a big issue with modeling. And I will tell you that a lot of people don't realize uh, this distinction. You know, they end up with disasters on their hands because you have a big model filled with code that is full of sound and fury and it signifies nothing because it, 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 it's, it's got lots of bugs and lots of, lots of problems associated with it. 
So where does this all come out with packages like AnyLogic and NetLogo or Repast? Well, the issues are much bigger here with Repast. It's very easy to have a huge implementation issue. With AnyLogic, a lot of, a lot, the, the, probably the primary reason we do AnyLogic, the two, the two primary reasons are support for hybrid modeling and support for visual modeling, which allows the design to often be captured directly without a lot of code. That's why we do it. We have these state charts, for example. In Repast, state charts have traditionally been, been, you have to just write tons of Java code to implement state chart functionality, traditionally, in, uh, in, in, um, in Repast. More recently, that's, that's less true. But, um, but it's basically this capacity to have designed and implementation that can be understood by the model, or like the person shaping the model who doesn't maybe want to know all sorts of things about Java coding, but they can understand enough to be confident the implementation and design match, and they can read the model, okay? Um, okay, so when you have a model that does have code, and all of your models of, of any size will have some code, you should, you should have, um, for any substantive coded areas, you should have some sort of description of what those do at a high level. Um, like, this carries out this task. What it does, even if the how is in code, okay? Um, by the way, I should have mentioned that. I, I stand remiss here. And Jason's wonderful repertoire, color-wise, would be helpful. This is, this is what the model does. This, ladies and gentlemen, is how it does it. How in terms of like the particulars of how it makes this happen. This is the province of what the model is supposed to do. And um, a good model implementer will, will need to understand that really well and the motivations for that and have dialogues about that. So this is what and this is how. And um, in any logic, for a fair number of things, like state charts, you describe the what, and it, and it, it is the how. It, it takes care of that. And the same thing is true with system dynamics models. So that's what stocks and flows. Um, if you have multiple people on the team, combine your work um, very frequently. Okay, so these are some comments on best practices. I mean, I, I, I commented on some common modeling mistakes uh, over there as well. Um, are there any questions related to this before I move on to a new topic? Any comments? Questions? In case you wonder, I teach software engineering and modeling, and so this gives me a certain perspective and a certain convict set of convictions on the best practices front that's a little bit different from most modelers. Most modelers tend to be not as familiar with best practices in terms of implementation. And it's that which can lead to like that disaster involving that code base. Um, complete, complete meltdown of a, of a model is horrible, horrible. Um, incidentally, what found the problems was a peer review by my group. We had a set of people go over it. We did peer review. We found shock. Okay. Um, I will stop my comments uh, there. And. Uh,